All right, thanks everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, like I said, we're gonna be talking about the financial assessment and how it affects the reverse mortgage. Uh, financial assessment was put in place by FHA to make sure all borrowers who got reverse mortgages were in a financial position to maintain the mandatory payments that are required on their loan. And just to re as a refresher, the only thing they're required to pay are their taxes and their insurance. So they don't have to make a regular mortgage payment, but they do need to be able to have the resources and enough money on a monthly basis to pay their taxes and insurance. So this is financial assessment part one. All right, the purpose of this financial assessment is to find the willingness. And willingness is pretty much considered uh, credit history and also to uh, be able to pay the property charges. And like I said, the charges are considered uh, taxes, insurance, and HOA dues if applicable. There are situations where they might not meet those circumstances and we can't work around them. Uh, with the capability, and that's to make sure they have the cash flow and resident, residential income to take care of it. So we're gonna talk about all the factors, we're gonna talk about the set aside, that is, if they don't meet those requirements, we can still get them a loan, but they're gonna have to pay some of the funds that are available to them, they're gonna have to set them aside to pay their taxes and insurance. In the regular mortgage world, that's an escrow account. So they will create an escrow account for them, but the difference is, it's not on a yearly basis, it's for the life of the loan. And then we're gonna summarize what we talked about. All right, financial assessment was started this year. Uh, like I said, HUD felt that a lot of people were put in a position where they weren't able to maintain their taxes and insurance. So they wanted to make sure that they were going, that we were a little more careful in getting people approved. And if they weren't meeting those guidelines, we gave them, there were things put in place to help them still be able to qualify for reverse mortgage. Like I said, a reverse mortgage is a tool that helps people with their financial freedom and their retirement. Capability, they wanna make sure by looking at their credit report, credit is not uh, a deciding factor, it is a factor. So if they have a history of not maintaining their uh, other bills and things of that nature, that can go into the financial assessment and cause them to have to get a set aside. The financial assessment went into effect in March. All right, so a complete financial assessment is a condition of every HECM loan that goes through. We look at the credit history, their property charge payments, and this is really for existing uh, property owners. So if they have a property and they have not maintained their taxes on it, then yeah, they might have to get a fund, they might have to get a set aside. We look at the income and assets, we look at their expenses, we look at everything going out, and we look at their resi uh, residual income. So they're gonna, we're gonna collect this information on them. This includes the non-borrowing spouse, if the borrowing spouse income is needed to qualify them. But if it isn't needed, then we won't pull the, we won't pull the non-borrowing spouse. You know, credit history, we look at the debts, the finances, and once again, the homeownership property and charge payment history. So if they have not been maintaining their mortgage payment, uh, and there might be delinquent on taxes and things like that, those could count against them in the financial assessment. But like I said, there are things put in place to assure that they still can qualify for a reverse mortgage. You know, right now on uh, Heckle for Purchase, those things are already looked at. And the point, the PowerPoint we're using today is from uh, Urban, their training that they did on financial assessment. And when you do a reverse for purchase, you already look at the income, you look at their, their expenses and things like that. You look at it almost like a regular purchase just to make sure that they, because they're bringing a large sum of money to the table to purchase the property, so we have to make sure that they are qualified, the money is seasoned, and uh, has been accounted for. So, and here's the good thing about it. A traditional credit report, it, it might not be available because a lot of times people get a certain age, they just no longer want to use credit, so they might not have a credit report. We do have, we do what they call a non-traditional mortgage credit report to show, you know, they can use phone bills, cable bills, things of that nature to show they uh, may have a payment history. 
you know, we, uh, you know, they look at the following items. They look and see if they're, all their housing payments and installment payments have been on time for the previous 12 months. Has no more than two 30-day late uh, mortgage or install, no, excuse me, no more than two 30-day late for the mortgage and for installment payments, credit cards, things of that nature, uh, uh, no more than uh, two within uh, 24 months. And they want to look for no major derogatory credit on revolving accounts in the previous 12 months. And it gives us a definition. Major derogatory credit is any payment more than 90 days after due date or three or more payments more than 60 days after due date. So, you know, there are guidelines, but, you know, we can work with them. So if you got somebody who has a touchy credit history, don't be in fear that they can't qualify. There are things that we can do to help them get qualified. You know, want to make sure there's no tax arrears within the last 24 months prior to the loan application. Homeowners and actually flood insurance, if applicable, was in place a minimum of 12 months prior to the date of application. And the borrower has satisfactory history of maintaining it. So that's going to determine if they can pay their taxes and insurance directly themselves. Uh, we make, once again, they make sure they got a satisfactory payment history on the mortgage, installment accounts, and revolving credit in that order. So mortgage, car note, credit card. That's how they look at them in that order. You know, we're going to look at the credit report. Uh, they're going to verify rent received directly from the landlord. So say, for instance, they're doing a purchase and they were renting something. They're going to look at the, uh, they're going to get something from the landlord showing that they have made their payments on time. And a lot of times we can review canceled checks that cover the previous 12 months. So you, once again, like I said, 12 months is the key, as long as they maintain those things within 12 months. You know, derogatory credit, they're going to look at it, okay, the, they're going to look at the cause of derogatory credit. So if there's some type of situation that came up where the borrower might have had medical bills or, you know, some type of situation that caused them to fall behind, they're going to look at those extenuating circumstances and we can work around them with that. You know, they're going to look and see whether the borrower resolved those issues and reestablished credit. So if they did fall into a problem, say, nine months ago, did they go about reestablishing it? You know, get on the plan and get caught up. So all those things are looked at. So we, they will work with them. You know, whenever the willingness, that's the key thing, willingness. So if they, want to, if they don't show a willingness to pay their bills and debts on time, then the life expectancy set aside. And that's where, like I said, they figure out, there's, there's a formula of figuring out their life expectancy. They take the taxes, insurance, multiply them by those years, and that's how much money they set aside. So one key thing and one positive thing is and they never have to make that payment is automatically deducted for them every month. Or excuse me, every year it's paid for them. In taxes twice a year, insurance once a year. You know, once again, extenuating circumstances, they look at those, and if they have had those, and if they write a letter of explanation explaining what happened, then there is a possibility that they can work with them and not do the set aside. So you need to work with your borrowers and talk to them, make sure you're asking these questions up front. So before you get to that point, you have all your ducks in order before you present it to the lender. You know, the big thing now is before they didn't really look at how much income they had coming in, but now they set minimum guidelines of how much income they have to have. And so we're going to talk about that. There's a chart that shows that. And the good thing about it, let's say for a person didn't qualify because after everything was deducted, they didn't meet the minimum. We can show, okay, hey, they're going to, the money they're getting, they're going to pay off some of that credit card debt. And once those credit card debts are removed, then their resident, residual income is going to be high enough. You know, they're going to look at traditional income, you know, employment income, rental income, pension, retirement, VA, Social Security. So we need paperwork showing all these, you know, these incomes that they're having. So we need to uh, 
the award letter from Social Security. We need current pay stubs. We need pension reports, letters from the pension showing how much they're going to receive. All right, so, and they use, the, they use the VA's formula. So pretty much a property has 1,500 square feet. They multiply that times the rate. So 1,500 15, times 0.14 equals $210 per month. That's, the, that's what they consider the utility bills, $210. So that's the formula that they use, and they, they subtract that from the income. So here's, the, here's what I was talking about right here. We're in the West, so a one person, after everything is said and done, they need to have $589 free and clear after all their expenses and everything for a family of one. Family of two, $998. Three, $1,031. Four more, $1,160. So like I said, if there's other people living in the house, their income can be looked at as well. Hmm, I think you skipped one on me. Okay, so we calculate the resident residual income as the total monthly income. So here we go. Barbara lives with her spouse and two grandchildren in Buffalo. She has a monthly income of seven thousand and has fifty six hundred in, in total monthly expenses. So seven thousand minus fifty six hundred that leaves her fourteen hundred. All right. So based on the previous table, let's go back up to it. She's in Buffalo, so she's in the uh, Northeast. She got to make $1,066. And we look at it. She got $1,400, so she qualified. You know, there might be some factors that can be considered to determine if the borrower has the capability to meet those financial obligations. And so, like I said, once again, that could have additional impact on how much they can pull out of the home. All right, so those things can offset weaker income. So they're going to use the borrowers, say if they didn't qualify for residual income under their table, the borrower, and they don't fall outside of it, we can consider those factors. Remember I said about the, if they have additional bills, that they're going to be paid off with a reverse mortgage, that can go into it. Or if, you know, the reason they wasn't meeting it because they originally paid a mortgage payment. Now that that mortgage payment has been removed, they can qualify. So it, everything is not set in black and white. It's a lot of gray. All right, so if the lender determines that they have to have the set aside, and once that money is sitting there, the borrower cannot cancel it. So like an escrow account, they can go in there and cancel it. They can't cancel this one. You know, if the financial assessment reveals the borrower's lack of capability or willingness, they can still go ahead and set, they will go ahead and set up the life, uh, life expectancy set aside. They do it for either a partial, a few years, or they can do it for life. Mostly, they're doing, they're doing fully because it's new and no one wants to make a mistake. So. They're doing it in full. You know, each lender is going to look at each individual's as each case by case, okay? Perfect example, I had a borrower who had just had a foreclosure this year. One lender said no, another lender said yes, and the loan funded. So you need to work with different lenders and see who's going to work with you and go through these situations. Because in, in traditional mortgage, a foreclosure this year, really no way they can get into an FHA or any type of loan like that. But as with reverse mortgage, they will work with them. Oh, what happened there? Oh, okay, I think that's part one already. Sorry about that. So that's part one. And like I said, if you have any questions, please just type them in the comment box and I'll get to them for you, okay? All right, so we're going to step two now. And the main thing about this financial assessment, it's going to be me just doing a lot of talking. Unlike the, some of the other ones where I try to make it more inter interactive, this is pretty much talking, talking about the guidelines. If you have a question, feel free to reach out to me. If I don't know the answer, 
you know, I can go to, we can go to the lender. Because what we do now is we pretty much pre-approve them before we even send them over. We, we, so we sit down and collect information. And next week, I'm going to talk about asking the right questions. I uh, probably should, maybe should have flipped them around, did asking the right questions before financial assessment. But I think financial assessment is key because I get a lot of people calling me regarding situations and they just don't understand that, okay, hey, even though credit isn't the driving force, we still have to ask these questions. So financial assessment is definitely the biggest thing right now in the industry. All right, we already know that. So we're going to talk about the overview. We already, we've already reviewed that. Pretty much, it doesn't matter if you're your race, color, religion, anything. Just like any other mortgage, revert, excuse me, any other uh, mortgage out there, they can't make that choice. So everything is based strictly off your history. So it's not, okay, hey, I don't like this person. You know, they're purple, they're red, green, I don't like them, so I don't think they should qualify. It's based strictly off their income their uh, credit history and things of that nature. So, you know, not, you know, you know, everything is strictly HUD guidelines. The complete financial assessment is done on every bar where it comes in. So we look at everything. You know, key thing, once again, what I tell people, don't pull credit up front. You have to ask them, you have to pretty much trust them. Because if you pull credit up front and they haven't had their counseling, then you can run into problems with lenders saying, hey, why did you put a credit and you hadn't, you hadn't got the counseling yet? Because when, once again, people who've been on this call know seven days, they have seven day moratorium where we can't do anything. So you need to ask those questions and once that seven days pulled, then you can put a credit and fill out, this, fill out a sheet. Each lender has a different sheet you can fill out to get a loan pre-approved before you submit it. You know, we collect additional documentations now. Recent paycheck stubs covering 30 days, W-2s, 1099s for most recent two years. I mean, a lot of them aren't really, depending on the situation, the 1099s, W-2s might not really be a big thing. Tax returns, if they're self-employed, is really big. They have all pages. Uh, any additional income documentation. So if they say, oh, I make uh, money selling flowers, then you need to provide documentation in order for it to be used. You know, bank statements for the last two months, all pages. And as we all know, that last page is normally blank. And if you forget to put nine of ten, if you forget to put ten of ten on there, even if it's a blank page, that statement is no good. So all pages. You know, if they're going to use any type of investment accounts, we need all statements of that as well. And any other additional document, asset documentation they can have. And also, we'll always pull a property tax statement. Good thing about most counties around here, you can put a property tax statement for them. Just log into it. All you need is the address, and you can bring up and see if their taxes have been paid or not. That's public, public information. All right, so now we're going to talk about credit and how it has effect on the reverse mortgage. You know, like I said, we talk about traditional credit. Hacking for purchase, non-traditional credit, which is which is which is interesting. And we're going to talk about what's considered satisfactory credit. We're going to talk about housing payment and derogatory payments, and we're going to define some of the property charges as well. We, we covered them earlier, but we're going to go in more detail with them now. All right. Once again, just credit history determines if the borrower has the district demonstrate the willingness in the past to be responsible in the management of debts, finances home ownership, property charges, and payment history. All right, thank you guys. I uh, had a little technical difficulty I had to correct. All right, so like I said, we're going to, credit history is going to look at all those items. Uh, they're going to analyze the overall pattern of the credit history and the loan application to identify if this person is the person who maintained their uh, payments in a proper manner. Delinqu oh, delinquent federal debt Pretty much, we can't really get around that. Unless they set up a payment plan and have a payment plan in place, we can't get around it. Um, you know, unpaid liens resulting from state or court order judgments. 
you know, satisfactory payment history of mortgage install, uh, installment accounts and revolving crowd, uh, account I mean, credit in that order. Satisfactory history of payment charges. And once again, here are taxes, insurance, and homeowners. All right, so, okay, we can't look at the credit history of non-borrowing spouse. So, any, so even the non-borrowing spouse uh, is under, under 62, and they might have excellent credit. Their credit is not taken into consideration. You know, once again, now they do the tri-merge accounts, credit reports, and pretty much we've always done that. We've always put the, the, uh, the merge credit reports. All right, if the income doesn't meet, let me see, reduce family size. So in addition, like pretty much federal debt, federal just must be paid in full or a satisfactory repayment plan must be in place prior to closing. Because once again, this loan is guaranteed by FHA and HUD. So they're not gonna allow us to go into loans where you have outstanding federal debt. You know, federal debt and liens cannot exceed the available net principal limit unless the borrower will bring funds to close to satisfy the debt. So once again, if this, they have such a high debt that it, it wouldn't qualify them, then, you know, it wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be able to qualify. Liens against the subject property must be removed. So any lien that's on there must be satisfied at the time of closing. So if they have, um, a lien from SMUD because they got some windows put in there. That lien must be paid at time of closing. You know, any state or court order judgment that were created against the real estate must be satisfied and removed. So, you know, every lien has to be paid. Just like normally when they do a refinancing, anything on there must be paid. And uh, unlike the conventional mortgage, you know, uh, a lender or a lien cannot step step down and you know you know step from sec go from first to second position to reverse mortgage so it must be paid mm. all right so once again so right here they said state and quarter judgments against the subject party can be subordinated to the heck on first and second liens at the time of closing be quite honest, they can, but no body is going to go third behind a reverse mortgage because they know the reverse mortgage is going to take everything, and um, you know they're pretty much giving up any leverage they had. So with those, you need to uh, make sure there's a plan in place to pay that off. And another again, if there's a claim paid within the last three years. We can ask for a, re a waiver to get it removed, but you know, normally if you have foreclosed on an FHA loan, you, you won't qualify unless FHA chooses to give a waiver. And you have to have certain, you have to have a very good reason why you foreclosed on it and didn't pay back FHA their money. You know, once again, um, for purchases, we would do the same financial uh, assessment on the purchase. Because once again, with a purchase, to say if they're purchasing a $200,000 home, they have to pretty much come up with $100,000 cash. And they're gonna be paying the taxes and insurance, so they wanna make sure that this person will be able to maintain those, uh, ch uh, those uh, property charges throughout the loan. You know, if a traditional credit report is available, we're gonna use it, otherwise, we can use a non-traditional credit report to develop it. You know, pretty much any time a credit score is generated is gonna use a report. So if there's no credit report generated, then we can go to non-traditional. You know, once again, like I tell you, non-traditional can be, uh, include three credit referrals, including at least one of the following. Rental, his, rental, rental housing payment, this is for purchase. Uh, telephone service or utility company referral. You know, if we can't pull all three of those, we might consider other ones. You know, payment of medical bills not covered by insurance. 12-month uh, savings. 
automobile le lease or a personal loan with repayment plan in writing. So if it's a lease, it's kind of contradicting. If it's a lease, it's going, to, it's going to show up on credit because you can't get a lease without credit. So unless you go through a private lender. Bankruptcies does not, chapter seven does not disqualify a bar from applying for a heckle for purchase, providing two years has passed. The borrower must have reestablished good credit or chose not to incur new credit obligations. If less than two years have passed, the borrower must show that the bankruptcy was a result of extenuating circumstances and document his or her ability to manage their financial affairs. All right, chapter 13, uh, pay repayment plan does not disqualify a borrower from applying for a heck of a purchase providing one year has passed since the uh, payout period. The borrower's payment performance has been satisfactory. The borrower receives permission from the bankruptcy court to enter into a heck of a purchase transaction. So if they're in chapter 13, they have to go to the trustee, hey, I'm looking to buy this house with a reverse mortgage, do I have your permission? So we have to go work with the trustee to do it. You know, once again, they consider the, there's no tax arrears in uh, prior 24 months. Uh, homeowner's insurance is in place. And there's a satisfactory history on the payment of the mortgage installment accounts, i.e. car loans and revolving credit. So you, it's a pattern here, 24 months taxes, 12 months insurance, and you notice in taxes, that's the biggest one. You can get around a lot of other things, but taxes, because if you're not paying your taxes, that's pretty much the only thing that can really cause you to get foreclosed, because then the county can come and try and foreclose on you. Then what's gonna happen is the reverse mortgage is gonna do it before the county does it. They're gonna pay the taxes and they're gonna foreclose on you. So it's very important that the borrowers maintain their uh, taxes, and they, and they will work with them. You know, they can't, you know, you call your lender and they'll work with you and tell you how to try and set up a payment plan with the county to make sure you don't get in that situation. You know, satisfactory credit. The borrower has made all housing payments, how housing installment uh, payments on time for the previous 12 months and has no more than two 30-day lates on the mortgage or installment payments for the previous 24 months. So you see, the mortgage, they're a little more stringent on that. They give them a little more flexibility on the installment payments. The borrower has no major derogatory credit on revolving accounts in the previous 12 months. And derogatory credit is defined as uh, 190 day or three or more 60 days within a year, within a year. So, you know, as long as they meet that, then they consider satisfactory credit because they can have small 30 days here and there, and they're not gonna really count it against them. It's when you get into the 90, 60, 90 days where it can become an issue. And this is just an example of a credit report. Um, you know, you look on, they're gonna look on here and see exactly what's on there. You know, once again, house payments is big. Uh, it's going to show on a credit report, and if they're renting, then they're going to they're going to need something from the landlord, uh, showing that the payments have been made on time. Or they can review cancel checks for the previous 12 months, showing that you made these payments and it's coming out of your account. So they can source it. They can see it coming out. They can see the money coming in and see it going out to to pay your rent. You know, once again, derogatory credit. You know, they're showing that they don't either have the uh, inability to manage the credit or they have a disregard for it. So inability, we can try and explain that way. Disregard, if they have the assets and they're not paying it, then that's going to show they don't have the willingness. And then, you know, then they can look at extenuating circumstances to work with them. Whether or not, you know, they can get the loan and not have to have the uh, uh, full financial assessment on it. All right, and here's the uh, derogatory credit could include the following requires special actions according to the Heckham Financial Assessment 
and property charge guys. So collections, charge off, disputed derogatory accounts, judgments, you know, delinquent federal tax, federal non-tax debt, delinquent uh, FHA insurance mortgage, and delinquent uh, federal tax debt. Pretty much the financial insurance, that means they most likely foreclosed on a uh, home before under FHA and that debt is still stand outstanding. Even though the uh, FHA paid the bank, it's going to show in their credit report as that balance that they still owe. You know, like I said, whenever they don't dis uh, dis uh, dis <laughs> wow, I can't get it out today, demonstrate uh, a willingness to meet their financial obligations, then, you know, the lifetime expectancy set aside can be in place. And it can be a pretty high number, depending on where they're at, their, their property taxes. You know, I had one where they had, it was 55000 was their set aside. So out of proceed, out of the money they could have got, 55000 was set aside to maintain their taxes insurance over the rest of their lifetime. The borrower wasn't happy, but at the end of it, they was like, fine, I ain't got to pay that anymore. I don't have to pay my, I don't have to pay a mortgage, I don't have to pay my property tax, so all my income, I could do whatever I want to do with it. So, you know, they looked at it as a glass half full versus half empty. And like I said, these are some of the things that, you know, you have to look at for property charges. Like I said, property tax, homeowner's insurance, flood, HOA dues, PUD and HUD fees, ground rents. That's something different right there. And other assessments. So if there's any type of mellow rule, like some parts of, you know, we got the mellow rule tax. So that's something that you have to maintain. That's considered a property charge. Cash flow, something we all like to talk about. <laughs> you look at that. All right, the purpose of cash flow, and we're gonna, we're gonna review that chart again. And like a lot of this stuff is gonna repeat because what they're doing is they, a lot of this information is repetitive. They want you to get in your head. They want you to see it. That way when you get and talk to these borrowers, there's no surprises. So we're going to talk about paying off defaulted liens and things of that nature. So, you know, most lenders are going to do, all lenders are going to conduct a cash flow, residual income analysis to determine their ability of the borrower to meet their documented financial obligations with their documented income. So my expenses are on a monthly basis $4,000. I only make $2,000. But I'm not going to cut down on my obligations because I, I, I like that lifestyle. $4,000 a month lifestyle is my lifestyle. But I'm only getting $2,000 a month. They're going to have to work. With, they're going to have to They're going to have to work with me, work with myself to get myself in a better financial position. So that's what they look at those type of things. And my, in that case, they're probably going to say, okay, Glenn, we'll give you reverse mortgage, but we're going to do a lifetime. We're going to do a set aside to help you manage because I don't, it's not an inability. It is an inability because... I chose to pull, you know, have more expenses than I need to have going out every month. So that's when they do the lifetime expectancy set aside. Once again, this is our chart. Like I said, we, I just really concentrate on the California. You know, when I do my financial assessments on people, you know, if it's one person, I'm just praying that after everything's been taken out, we meet this number right here. That's my magic number. A couple, 998. They got a couple people, live, got a person to live with them. You got to look at that as well. But remember, it's only the income of the borrowers, you know, that are looked at. You know, sometimes they will go back there in streamlined circumstances, will look at the other people, and then they have to be, doc all the income has to be documented. You know, we, then we're going to go with them. We're going to need check stuff. We're going to need this and that. So, you know, if they don't meet those guidelines, there are still ways to get around it. And, and they try to make the guidelines, the income requirements, fairly accessible for most people. You know, even when they're just getting Social Security, you know, they, normally they can hit that 589. Because normally they don't have a lot of expenses sticking out there. And then, like I said, once again, it breaks down. To break, these, are Calif these are all the West Coast. Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, uh, Hawaii, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico. Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Washington, 
and Wyoming. Did everybody know those states? You remember that from uh, civics class, all your abbreviations? You remember those? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> all right. If the borrower pays off defaulted liens, they're going to determine if the, if the heck of it's being used to pay off those liens. They're going to look at the circumstances leading to the default and whether the heck on proceeds is a, a solution. See? So if they're in a situation, they got those liens, and they're saying, hey, I'm in this position. Hey, I have medical bills, different things. I want to pay off all this stuff. With, the finance, with this reverse mortgage, it's going to allow me to get back on my feet and pay off all that. They're going to look at that. They're going to assess how those existing loans will, once they're, once they're taken away, how it's going to increase their cash flow. So in my situation, hey, I got my $4,000, I got my $2,000 coming in. I'm going to use my reverse mortgage proceeds to pay off most of those. And once I pay them off, guess what? I'm down to only $1,500 a month expenses, and I'm up to $2,000 income. So now I'm $500 in the black every month. So, you know, that is a situation where it helped me help myself. And they do look at those type of situations. You know, look at it once again, traditional income sources, employment, rental income, pension, VA benefits, Social Security. You know, they, you know, once, once again, as long as you got documentation of the income, it's good. I mean, sometimes, you know, I got this one account I'm working with. Her Social Security met everything. She get enough money in Social Security, she met all the requirements. So I didn't even use her pension. Her pension would have shot her way over, but I mean, why use it? Because then it might bring up other questions that they have. If they come back and ask me, then hey, here's her pension income, but her Social Security met the income, so I didn't do it. You know, I like to give them the bare minimum because if you give them too much, they might bring additional questions. But, you know, always have it there in case they do need it. So ask for everything up front. And, you know, a lot of times people, oh, it's hard to ask them the questions. You know, if, if, you, if you're a mortgage person, you, you have to be able to ask those questions, right? You, you got to ask them. Before you, do, before you even do anything, what are you asking for? <laughs> Income, tax returns, you gotta ask those questions. And so what's, what's gonna separate us from a lot of other people who do strictly reverse mortgages, they're scared to ask those questions because they never had to ask them before. But you know, they'd be surprised. Most people, when I'm talking to them and I'm telling them what I need, they, they already have, okay, you're gonna need this, this, and that. So they already know what type of information they're gonna need, so. And like I said, these people, this is not their first time in a rodeo. You know, you know, it, you know like I said, once again, non-brown spouse's income, it doesn't need to be uh, provided. However, they can voluntarily provide the information, and then it can be used in figuring in the factors. So, but if they use the income, they're going to probably have to use the, they have to use the credit as well. So if they're bringing a lot of debt, so yeah, here, I, I got this, once again, in my situation, Hey, I'm bringing, I got $2,000 additional that can help us qualify for this. But I'm bringing $4,000 worth of monthly expenses with me. I might not, I'm doing more harm than good. So you got to look at all those uh, situations before you bring the number on spouse in. All right, so these are some of the type of incomes that we can look at. You know, I'll let those sit up there. You know, pretty much. Well, we all standard things that we can look at, just as long as it can be documented. Self-employment, as long as you got the, the bank account showing that you got you know, a certain amount of money coming in, your tax returns showing the income, they can qualify. You know, investments, you know, IRA 401k, you know, annuities. So long as they got statements showing these, these assets coming in on a monthly basis, it can be used towards the income. But like I said, once again, if they qualify, I'm probably not going to use all their sources of income because then you might open up <laughs> you know, more, more questions. Because underwriters love, when you give them a piece of information, what do underwriters love doing? Oh, let me give you a new condition. 
So I don't, you know, I don't give them nothing but unless they ask for it. All right, so they can use either 100% or 85% of assets based on the table found in the financial assessment of property charges. So, you know, you just need to get that information and once again, you want to be careful what you submit. You might think you're doing a, a, a justice to the borrower, but you know, say the borrower, you know, getting Social Security, but they also have a, a business. They've done you, so I'm going to provide all this business income, and then when the taxes come in, they're, you know, you, when you do taxes, you're trying to pay as little money as you can, and then you get their tax return and show that they're in a negative, showing that they're losing money in this business. Guess what? That's going to withdraw. That's going to subtract from their Social Security. And now, oh, you can't qualify because you don't make enough money because your business is causing you to lose money. So that's why I'm saying you want to be careful what information you provide and you want to do your due diligence before you do it. Because guess what, you're, you're going to have to be the one to tell them, oh, okay, you don't qualify now because I submitted this and if I wouldn't have submitted you, you would have qualified for it. You know, that's not going to be a comfortable conversation. I know I don't want to have it. You know, once again, the adjusted discount value, so with 401 you know, 401k and IRAs and news, they can't use 100% of those funds because, you know, with tax consequences, things like that, they're going to they're going to they're going to discount some of that value. So, like I said, if they can qualify without those items, there's really no need to put them in there. You know, unless it's a set payment, like say it's an annuity and they have a set payment coming every month. For five, say it's for five hundred dollars set for life. Yeah, you can use that. But if you're saying, oh, they got this four hundred one k, but they're worth two hundred k, we're gonna use that. They're gonna devalue that, and it can, you know. So, you know, get them to meet the bare minimum. Because if you meet the bare, if you meet the requirement by one dollar, it's the same as meeting it by a hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't matter. It's just a pass or fail, like the state, like the uh, real estate test, just pass or fail. They don't give you a score. So you need to look at it like that. You know, these are some of the expenses that they're going to look at. Federal state income tax, property charges, judgments, annuity and child support. And I'm hoping too many of my borrowers aren't paying child support at this age. Hopefully <laughs> the children are all over 18, but you never know. Somebody might have married young and got a young child now. So any payments under bankruptcy plan, those are expenses they're gonna they're gonna identify using your calculation. So here we go again, one nice thing. So the VA, uh, this is what we did earlier. So the 1,500 square feet, living area times 0 0.14, $210, that's their monthly utility charges and their maintenance. Once again, it's got two children, 1,400, $1,066. So this person will qualify for it because they have enough money coming in. So we, we take the, they will subtract the 210 plus any other things out of this 1606, I mean, uh, 101066. All right, so once again, the lenders, they're going to evaluate the files for the ability and willingness to pay ongoing property charges. And they're going to, you know, make sure they qualify for the reverse mortgage based on that and see if they're going to need to have a set aside for those property taxes. Uh, because this, it, I feel, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the financial assessment and everything that it asks now, but I'm also do believe that is some people do help them. Because the last thing you want to do is get one of your borrowers in the house and five years later they're calling you up their foreclosing because I pay my property tax. You know, hey, I'd rather them take the hit up front and stay in the home versus have to get a call asking what can I do. All right, so this is part two. And you know, this one we're gonna talk about the set aside again. And it's pretty much just a follow up for, from the previous one. You know, we got our purpose of it. You know, the mortgagee letter. We're gonna talk a little bit about, this is gonna be more about 
credit history and payment charges. You know, this is the chart. Like I said, once again, you're going to see a pattern. They're going to keep showing this chart, letting you see what, you know, income is needed to qualify for this. And so this is a chart that just showed borrower and her spouse with two grandchildren, Buffalo, 7000 minus the 5600 expenses, $1,400 uh, a month, and they only needed 1066 to qualify. All right, so when the borrower does not meet the income requirement, the lender can consider many uh, factors to determine whether the borrower has demonstrated the uh, capability to meet that. They can go to low draw, so they might not let them take out as much money as they normally could at the beginning. They're going to leave a little more in reserve. You know, they can use uh, residual income from number on spouse. You know, they can ask, uh, they can see the property charges into for the life expectancy. So they can say, okay, hey, we can put this on there for your life expectancy for you. You know, they can look at, say, the borrower might start receiving a pension or Social Security within the next 12 months. That's going to get them more money because a lot of times they might not, people might defer to Social Security or their pension to a certain age for they can maximize the value on a monthly basis. You know, the borrower has access to a revolving credit or other sources of income. You know, the more the debt is being retired with the mortgage payment. So let's say, once again, they're retiring that mortgage and they're retiring some other debt with the reverse mortgage. They, that can go ahead and help them qualify and meet it. The borrower has uh, overtime. Uh, bonus income and seasonal employment that can help them reach that bare minimum that they need. So they, they will look at all those factors and work with the borrower. So, so once again, it's up to you as a loan officer to ask those type of questions. If you see your borrower might be in danger of not meeting that, it's up to you to ask the question to say, hey, do you have a part-time job? You know, do you have any, uh, in, any other income you're going to start receiving in the next 12 months? Ask those questions, help them get, get there. All right, and, and also they're going to look at the, the, uh, the assets that they're getting, what type of impact is going to have on it. So is it going to eliminate the debt? Or what if they're going to say, okay, I want a monthly payment. So I don't want to take all the cash, I want a monthly payment from my reverse mortgage. Guess what, that's going to increase their monthly income. Because now they're going to have this monthly payment coming in there. You know, impound monthly income from principal limit after taking into the initial disbursement. Once again, it, they're going to look at ways to work with you to make sure that your borrower can qualify. So, okay, they get this money. They're going to go ahead and pay off a chunk of debt. So it's going to reduce that, and now they're able to do it. Or they're going to say, okay, we're going to take some money out front and we still want to take monthly payments to help us with our income. So with that, you know, you just have to work with them and put together the um, best plan for them. Some, search, some uh, extreme range circumstances that they will look at. Lost income, loss of income due to the death or divorce of a spouse. Due to unemployment for the borrower's spouse. You know, increased financial obligations due to emergency medical treatment or hospitalizations. You know, increased financial obligations due to emergency property repair not covered by insurance. So if they had some of these circumstances that happen that caused them to fall behind on certain bills, then that can be taken into consideration as well. Property charges. So once again, that's the biggest thing. You want to make sure that they are paying those taxes. They want to make sure they are paying their insurance. You know, if they, if they don't require a set aside, then they have to maintain those uh, charges. And I'm, I'm thinking some people are going to automatically start going, you know what, set aside isn't that bad. You know, I don't have to pay it. You know what, I never had that money, so let me just not have to pay that. And guess what? Let's say they die two years later, you know, before they get accident, die two years later. 
that money goes back onto their uh, equity. So whatever is not spent paying on those taxes insurance, they get it back in equity. So they're not losing it, it's there. You know, like I said, this was that they authorized them to pay the property uh, uh, charges and assume responsibility for the monthly payment of charge. So, you know, the lender said, okay, we'll take care of it for you. You don't have to deal with it. You know, they calculate the uh, life, set life expectancy set aside by calculating projected life expectancy of the person. So there's a formula in there, <laughs> you know, that the insurance company have that determines how, what age we're all going to die. You know, like when you buy life insurance, you know, as older you get, you know, your premiums go higher because they had, you know, the insurance companies, you know, they, they know everything. They, they have a certain number that they look at. You know, they look at the increase in taxes insurance rates. So when they figure that out, okay, your insurance, your taxes might be Three thousand dollars now, but five years from now they might go up to thirty-four hundred. So they have to take those considerations in there as well. You know, they look at the average monthly uh, mortgage interest rate and the life expectancy of the youngest borrower. So they do the youngest borrower. So when they figure all these things off, they go off the youngest borrower. All right. So pretty much fully funded. That's where they take everything, life expectancy of the youngest borrower. They figure out that and they put all that money in a set aside account. And they, every year they pay the, they pay the um, homeowner's insurance. Every two years they pay the property tax. So they won't have to, so the borrower won't fall behind or anything like that. Then there's one called a partially funded where they're going to they're gonna do it for a few months. I mean, not, excuse me, for a few years. It might be five years. They're only going to pay them for the first five years to get a borrower a chance to get in the habit of, you know, making payments, get in the habit of, or get a, give a borrower a chance to get more financially set, retire some of the debt, then they can start making those payments on their own. So there's a partially funded and fully funded. But like I said, mostly they're going to fully funded. Because anytime there's a new change, no one wants to make a mistake. So if someone said, if they qualify for something, okay, let's get them partial, and if something happened down the line, then the underwriter's gonna get, they're gonna look at the underwriter and say, hey, why did you not give a fully funded life expectancy set aside? So no one wants, excuse me, so no one wants to make that mistake, especially in the mortgage industry. Everybody know, once, the, once we sign an uh, application, once we sign a loan document, we attach that loan for life. You know, if the new changes, we're attached, you know, you do a loan on somebody 10 years from now, you might get a, 10 years down the line, you might get a call <laughs> from HUD asking, hey, why did you get this person's loan? Uh, first of all, I don't remember this person. Uh, well, you shouldn't get them a loan. They fore their home foreclosed. 10 years down the line, they still might come ask you a question. And it's not extreme, but everybody know with Dodd-Frank, that is one of the requirements. That, that is a provision in there now you know, the underwriter and the loan officer are attached to it. So it doesn't matter if they lost their job, they got divorced, something like that, they still can come back and ask us why we did it because of, you know, all the problems we had before in the past. You know, recent debts, you know, they want everything seasoned, like for new refinances and things like that, they want it seasoned. So it had to be in place longer than 12 months or result in 500, less than $500 cash to borrowers. And this, this is something that came into effect December 15th. And I got a borrower that I'm working, we're working on this situation right now. We're, I'm drafting, I'm working with her to draft a letter because in February she refinanced. She, she needed to uh, do some repairs on the house because the house was becoming unlivable. She had plumbing issues. She had uh, dry rot. She had a lot of different issues that she needed to get taken care of. She took out $25,000 cash, and they're saying, well, it has to be seasoned. It hasn't been 12 months. She was eligible. Her <laughs> Funny thing about her, her house appraised at $700,000, and she owed her current mortgage. Her mortgage was only 200 and 
seventy-five thousand, so she took out twenty-five thousand. If she wanted some money, she could take out a lot more money with a house appraisal at seven hundred thousand. So we're we're working with them, letting them know, hey, this money was taken to make repairs to the house, make it livable, and she didn't know she didn't know she didn't know of her options of reverse mortgage at that time. So that's something we're working on. And hopefully, you know, I can get the lender to give us an exception. But I'm also working with two other lenders telling them the same story, trying to get somebody to approve it. Because whoever approved it first, that's who get the loan. And so that's another thing, you know, we, I shop for results. Like you need a broker, that's a big good thing about being a broker, we can shop for results. We can go down our list of every lender we have and tell them our scenario, whoever said I can do it, Bam, you get the loan. <laughs> because guess what? At the end of the day, we don't care who name is on the loan. We don't care who name is on the broker check. That's our, we want to get to that, that funding date. All right, so once again, the 1009, and then it will require you to capture income, expenses, assets, and liability. In the past, when we did, when we did reverse mortgages, when we did application, we didn't fill out all this stuff in there. We put bare minimum information and sent it in there. Now, every box has to be filled in. So that, that's one of the things that, you know, we have to get used to. Every box needs to be completed now. So this is like a worksheet that they have that you can put information in there and you can see what their res, you know, you put the name in there, blah, 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 what the taxes are. And you can send this over to them and they can say, okay, they qualify, they don't qualify. So you put all this information up in here the income, the property charges, and things of that nature. And you send it, you can send it over and get it pre-approved. And like I said, I normally, I pretty much took one of these sheets from a lender, the, the one lender gave me, I took their branding off, put our branding on there, so I sent the same sheet to three or four different lenders. And shop around. Pretty much, we're, we're responsible for putting into uh, to reverse vision now. So this is, this is something they have. We don't bother with that. We enter into reverse vision, and then they capture it and stick it in there. So now, once again, we have to fill out all the boxes. And in the past, we're, we didn't have to fill out all the boxes. So it's now it's similar to a uh, Ford mortgage, where when you're in uh, points, you have to fill in all that information when points pull everything in from the credit report, it just fills it in for you. So now we have to enter everything in there. All right, so the summary is, they're looking at the ability and willingness to pay for ongoing property charges. Um, you know, they won't necessarily be disqualified for it, but they might be required to have a set aside. So it's just an initial assessment, which about see if they qualify for the reverse mortgage and which borrowers require a set aside for the property charges. You know, the worksheet, it captures all the information like credit history, property charge, income assets, and then um, we take it from there. You know, once again, part 2A, was the part before this, it talks more about the credit history and things like that. And uh, one thing that we are doing, uh, we're, we're, we're getting with a new, we're signing up with a new credit provider, you know, same, pretty much same fees we're paying now. But this new credit uh, provider is going to allow us to, once we pull credit, we pull it through reverse vision. Like I said, once again, reverse vision is a system that we use. We pull credit through reverse vision and it automatically dumps everything and it, we pull credit and dumps, it fills in all those blanks for us. Just our point, when you pull in things in point, you can see it, pull, it drops in all the credit in there so you don't have to go in there and manually input it. So it takes away one step, take away the human element of you making a mistake of in, inputting the wrong information. All right, so these are some uh, terms on here. You know, bankruptcy, uh, compromising f uh, factors, discount rates. And like I said, once again, for us, 
most of us, we do conventional mortgages, so we're, we're used to this. So this is stuff that we know. It's just a matter of converting into the reverse field. So it's not as stringent as a conventional mortgage, but you know, it's, it's, it's change. And anytime there's change, people have to get used to it. All right, these are just some of the resources where you, people can go look at information. And uh, well, that's their thing, but we also have an email address now called, uh, oh God, we just did that. ERS reverse mortgages at ers-nationwide.com. Um, I'll put it up on some more information, but we got a, a new email address. So if you got a scenario, you can email it in there. We can look at it and help you walk through it. Or you can just give me a call at 916-549-3506 or email me. And like I said, so the financial assessment is just pretty much what you do on a, on a conventional mortgage applied to the uh, reverse field. All right. so. You know, that's the training, that's all the information I have on the financial assessment. Uh, are there any questions and things that I, I might have went over that you don't understand? Any questions from the audience today? That's that's any mortgage. any mortgage. Yeah, that's any any mortgage. Yeah, as loan officers, we attach to it now. Uh, our name is on there. They're gonna come back there. And it's often when people were doing auto subprime loans, we were giving loans to people we know didn't qualify. And I look at it like this: brokers didn't approve no loans. Banks approved those loans. So if we submitted it to the bank, and the bank approved it. The bank did it. We just submit paperwork, you know. You know, you can submit, you know, you have the right to submit a loan on anybody. You know, the person I want to I want to do a loan, you submit it in there. If it's not approved, then you're gonna give them the denial letter. But if they approve it, that's the bank. But and Dob Franks and all the ruling, they came down on the loan officers and they really came down on loan officers and, and the banks. I feel got a pass. That's just my personal opinion because the banks, they really didn't get the, the, the standards that the brokers got. And like I said, once again, brokers didn't, brokers submit loans. We don't approve them. But yeah, but to go answer your question, underwriters and loan officers are now uh, attached to these loans. Yes, Jackson, I will go ahead and uh, make it available. Send me an email and I'll see your copy of them. And once again, my email address is right here, glenn.thomas at elitenorcal.com. Just shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to send you the slides or any other slides that you have or answer any questions that you have. I mean, if, that's, if we have no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the training. And I know this one was just pretty much me standing up here reading off the things, but hey, you know, sometimes, you know, these type of things is just pretty much just black and white. You just got to go through it. I'd like to appreciate, I appreciate you all for joining me tonight. And uh, next week we'll be a little more interactive. Next week we'll be asking the right questions. And uh, to me, that's one of my favorite topics. So we're not talking about product. We're talking about qualifying your borrowers, getting your borrowers in a position to where they can make a decision to move forward with you. All right, so if there's no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast now. And I'd like to thank my studio audience for keeping me company here today. <laughs> and everybody out there. All right, thanks and have a good evening, everyone.